<laughs> yes, that was us um, both failing to become Wolvertoons, real life action Wolvertoons. Yes. Because yes. on this episode of Products Comics Products, we are talking Basil Wolverton. Yes, specifically Creeping Death from Neptune. The Life and Comics of Basil Wolverton, Volume 1, 1909-1941, put out, of course, by Fantagraphics. Mm -hmm. um, so, right, so we should. I should probably mention, so this is my choice, and I should mm -hmm. probably mention um, how I kind of, um, in, a, in a way, uh, miss chores. Um, so... One of the things I'm hoping to get out of the Product Comics Boys project is it pushes me to read more comics and, and, and stuff that I should know mm -hmm. more about. And there's an awful lot of comic book writers and artists and, uh, you know, uh, titles and, and periods and, uh, that swirl around in my brain that I have a vague notion of what they are, but mm -hmm. I'm not really deeply steeped in it so this is the project is kind of an excuse for me to finally you know engage with it mm -hmm. and basil wolverton i was familiar with some of his amazing artwork of course as most people would be through uh, mad magazine mm -hmm. right and uh, but i don't think i had ever like you'd see a Basil Wolverton drawing here and, you know, he has a very, very distinctive mm -hmm. style, right? And, but I, I don't think I'd ever, you know, read a, a collection or, or knew much about him or anything like that. So um, one of my um, vices, I'm going to call it a vice because it mm -hmm. often gets me into trouble, is this inability, so we, this separates us a little bit. And you're a lot better at um, handing, jumping, jumping yes, handing, handing over um, the reins to uh, and trust other people to mm -hmm. be your guide through yep. things. So, for instance, yep. in your case, if you're interested in Basil Wolverton, you would have looked up a pri or you would have got like the best of Basil Wolverton or or something, mm. you know, to jump in with. Yeah, but. I'm the kind of anal retentive person who mm -hmm. insists, oh, I'm slightly interested in this. I'll go and buy the complete <laughs> fucking works of this person from volume one. I did the same thing with Robert Crumb. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever, I mean, I love Robert Crumb and I'm more familiar mm -hmm. with Robert Crumb than Russell Wolverton, but holy fuck. You go back to the complete Robert Crumb. You're talking volumes one and two, where it's like things that he wrote in the margins of his textbooks in school yep. or childhood, and and mm -hmm. it's, the, it's it's the perfect way to actually kill yeah. a yeah. burgeoning interest that you have in mm -hmm. something. But yeah. fuck it, I've done it again. I went back to the beginning, mm -hmm. which I shouldn't have done. I should have chosen. I something. did wonder. I did wonder if volume two might be. Potentially more. Well, interesting volume in two way. is still only 1941 to 1952 or something like that. So I don't think right. we're anywhere near peak Wolverton. Um, I, I'm assuming Fantagraphics will get to that at a certain mm -hmm. point. So, so from the beginning, we should point out warning to anyone out there who's like me who wants to get into something. I mean, we'll get to this, but actually, I'm, I'm not dissing. This is actually a fantastic yes, it book is. for what it is. Mm -hmm. But you might already want to be a, a Wolvertonian mm -hmm. before this isn't entry level. No, this isn't. This is, entry level. this is for the this is for the completist yes. who wants to read the same story four times <laughs> um, with slight changes right. of name and angles and things like that as he as he basically works his craft out. That said, though, I did get quite a lot of enjoyment out of this book so that my mia culpa out the way did this place it slightly differently for you because were you already more familiar with it but so this would have been more interesting nope. for you or oh okay no no but but it was but maybe 
it was interesting for me in in another way, right? Because I'm somebody who has, you know, a very small amount of experience in actually making my own comics, right? Um, and so it was really interesting for me to kind of track his growth as an artist, you know, from the earliest kind of days. And he's not um, classically trained, right? He didn't right. go to art school. And so, you know, he, 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 there is some pretty wonky and interesting looking physiognomy sometimes happening in anatomy, which which happens when you don't have that classical training. And the fa sad fact of the matter is, as has been pointed out by many comic artists like um, Daniel Klaus and, and Joe Matt and people like that, um, it doesn't happen in art school anymore any, anyway. So almost nobody is properly classically trained anymore. I don't feel I had anything like the level of, um, you know, training in specific technique or even in like proper draftsmanship or proper proportion that you would have gotten if you had gone to art school in the 50s or the 1850s or the 1050s maybe not the dark ages but go go back you know again to go back again to greek and roman times right when there was this kind of um apprenticeship system where you really had to work at your kind of work it out so um, a lot of yeah, people. To, to be fair, though, I'm wondering in ancient Greece if some of the apprenticeship system wasn't also getting sodomized between well, lessons, right? That... Potentially in Greece, anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, we've lost our one Greek viewer. <laughs> that'll, um, that'll learn you. Yeah. That's, um, that's how it sticks in the mind, or that's how you remember things. <laughs> if you have a, a sharp butt fucking afterwards, <laughs> that'll make you remember it. Yeah. Yeah, I would imagine. Um, but uh, is that what you're saying, Nick? Is that what you're saying? We should bring back. That's what I'm taking from this conversation. So do you think then maybe if, if I've been sodomized after reading each of the stories in the book we talked about just a moment ago, you remember remember them all, yeah. some of them. with 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 sharp clarity. <laughs> um, anyhow, so what I what I did enjoy was watching somebody learn their craft kind of by themselves, like on their own. And, you know, I mean, as you pointed out, we were talking about this before we got on here, that this book has quite a lot of um, biographical stuff in it. It really is a, a biography with comics. Like, you know, you'll get kind of 10, 15, 20 pages of just text about his life, and then we'll get a selection of comics, and then we'll go back to another big chunk of text about his life. And so living kind of out west in the US, not living in New York, kind of in a way cut off from a lot of what else was going on. He really was kind of just out there figuring it out for himself and kind of, you know, um, yes. and that, makes, that makes the comics in a weird way fresher than some stuff that might be more polished, I feel. Right, right. No, it, it is, it is kind of, I, I suppose, um, where it's so like you said it's 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 very much the stuff about him the his progression as an artist and and as a as a young man as well that kind of stuff is kind of interesting i suppose where it might get into the weeds and lose some people is when it gets into the minutiae of um you know letters back and forth to editors, editors yeah, yeah about you know panel sizes or and, and <laughs> right. like that like my eyes yeah. did start to glaze over a little bit at some of that but yes yeah, so, so but i would but i was wondering if it does so for instance i was thinking in my case if there was something i was already fascinated about and i would re like you know i don't know the uh, the career of uh Marky smith and the fall or something like that mm -hmm. if there was a book that was entirely exchanges between Marky Smith and record publishers and arguments. I would probably enjoy reading that. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. So maybe if you are already a Basil Wolverton fan, um, or maybe this is interested. I mean, I have to say that this is this is an era of comics. This is really the beginning of comic books, right? This kind of this move from comics just being something that is your Sunday funnies in your in your newspaper, right? And this is you know. Um, You'll see in the book they talk about the syndicates, right? And the syndicates, which you know, they almost are the kind of mafia-sounding thing that they sound like they are. Um, they basically ran and still do run, for the most part, as as far as I know, um, 
the comics pages in, I mean, you know, newspapers are a dying thing. So I don't know to what degree actually there still is newspaper comics. I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose Garfield and, and that stuff is still. Agatha Horrible. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, but for, you know, I, I, as when you were a kid, I'm sure you, if you ever read the comics or got collected works, you would always see, you know, United King features syndicate or there's three or four yeah, kind of yeah. syndicates that seem to kind of own most of the comics page. Um, and the so, thing, you know. The thing that I remember confounding me that is like tangent, but so, so the comic strips like the Garfields or the Haggers or things like that, which were three panel gags. Mm -hmm. I understood that. And for a while, I, I seem to even remember cutting them out of the paper and gluing them into a scrapbook. Yeah, for, while. for some reason we did that too. But the thing that re really confused me was, I think it might have been the Daily Star, which we didn't get, only saw it occasionally. So again, it was even more spotty and weird. But I think it was the Daily Star that ran a Judge Dredd yes, strip. Yes, yes. And yeah. I think they were original stories as well, right? They weren't. They were yeah, six panel. Yeah. Six panel little things. Yep. But but fuck all happened in those. <laughs> like you would read, oh fuck's sake, and then you'd have to wait, and it was just a very frustrating way to read that kind of story, right? Yes. Yes. And they were all drawn. I think Ron Smith kind of got seconded from 2000 AD to go draw those. So he had been a 2000 AD artist, and then for quite a long time was was bashing those things out um and then they did later on they did collect them into volumes so that which made them easier to i could imagine yeah that, that to read but, yeah and that makes sense but in like what who who thought those were, like who was that's just and, but, yeah, it went on for, apparently it went on for years yeah like, it did. I, I, I had a couple years. of books that i bought it like when they finally did collect them i bought the books when i was you know a kid uh, before we left ireland but um the other well, story so as well that jumps out at me was, do you remember George and Lynn? They, they were like a married couple, and I can't remember if they were swingers or anything, but <laughs> basically the appeal of that was they were always naked, or Lynn was always naked, her breasts were always exposed, and it was always just stories of them like lying around in the bedroom, like just having husband and wife conversations. This, this ran in where? The Sun. The sun, oh well, okay, yeah, all right. Um, um, yeah, it was just you know, it's like again, three or four months ago, like, oh, darling, is you know, how is it going at work or some, you know, something, and and you know, she was extremely sexy, and and, mm -hmm. and but it was just very gentle kind of relationship comedy stuff, I guess, but with jugs. Really? Okay. Yeah, and there were a few other kind of similar ones as well. I think it wasn't just George and Lynn. There was like a some other similar this is okay. uh, something that just came back to me as an odd um they still make more sense than the judge dread strip mm -hmm. but, uh, um, so i mean i think for me i was quite interested in tracking through his career because his career really begins at the sort of the point at which comic books go from being something or comics go from something that's kind of specific to the newspaper to being a standalone yes like the yeah. comic book right you know and really, at the beginning, um... Greta Garbo was very fond, extremely fond of corned beef and cabbage. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what the context of this is. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, you know, and, and it seems like the first comics, the first, like, published comics were often just... Um, cast offs from or people who couldn't get published they couldn't get their stuff syndicated because they weren't good enough or they weren't it wasn't finished enough or they you know it was too strange and so it's interesting to me that's the thing that's w wolverton from the very beginning his stuff is weird and it's weird in ways that seems to frighten editors right yes where they're like your characters are like this is a funny comic but your characters are so weird looking that they're actually frightening you know charles lawton <laughs> Yes, those are those are getting into his, his more kind of his caricatures are brilliant. Cartoon. I love his caricature. They must have inspired um, someone who's going to pop up in this YouTube video again uh, in a few. Is uh, Drew Friedman? Oh yes, I would think so. Well, I mean that's I think that's Wolverton's kind of 
maybe his biggest um, influence really is actually on the next generation. It's on it's on the generation of yeah. the sixties. Yeah. It's it's on the Robert Crumbs and uh, that whole that whole crowd. Because even when I was looking at stuff like this, I mean, um, I was really taken by how much like Robert Crumbs. Yes, um, absolutely. Early yeah. stuff. Some of this stuff is, you know, like the, the kind of the distortion of the characters. The, I mean, it is a general kind of nineteen thirties comic book approach. But but his tendency to go in for that kind of tight cross hatching and and stippling and all that kind of the pen and ink work. I mean, another thing that as just a, somebody who likes to draw comics really um, was interesting to me was how he really had to pull back from that because his editors were like you're leaving no space for color like he was like the work was so right densely stippled and cross hatched and like you know they were like you've yeah. like, like just there's no point in color trying to apply color to this because it's just going to turn into a black page um it, yeah in but, terms of the artwork it's all very interesting from the beginning um but the humor stuff is is really really kind of Dated as well, like uh, apart from uh, quite a lot of casual racism, yeah, uh, a lot of it. But also, like, there's a certain type of comedy of this era, which is. It's not even that it's so. It's not. It's not that it's so dated that you're like, no, oh, you know, it's not like groan-inducingly corny. Although it is that as well. But it's just mm -hmm. a lot of the humor from this era, which is uh, why some comedy movies from this era actually are quite fascinating to me. Um, less, less of the it. It's so like I don't even understand what the references are. Context, so the context is, yeah. They just seem like like inane or something. And and and, mm -hmm. and I'm guessing some of the captions for some of these things are by other people as well, right? So they really undercut his great artwork with just like some yeah. <laughs> almost ir irrelevant kind boring of boring non sequitur about yeah, you know. yeah. Oh, it's funny. I, I, this is embarrassing to me, but it took me the longest time to figure out why this character was called Disc Eyes the Detective. Mm. Um, and, and then at one point I was like, oh, hang on, because he, he can change his face. And it's like... Disc And I was like, yes. yeah, I, I, it was, I, you know, it was, I was pretty near the end of the book before I put that together, which is not a great reflection on my intelligence. Kind of um, interesting as well to consider that if, uh, one of his uh, one of his earlier gigs, uh, Basil would have done before he started, because uh, he was kind of a bit of a um, a journalist, you know, more <laughs> kind of well-rounded journalist before he specifically became a cartoonist. Was that he was on the set of Buster Keaton's The General? Which yeah, yeah, it's been a fascinating experience. Interesting, but it's also it's interesting. He's not a guy who looks at all like what you imagine he might look like. In that way, we've had this conversation before about how when I uh, was going to meet Jorg Butgerite, I imagined him as he was going to be right, a little hunchbacked, right, right, right. you know, um, German uh, figure. And you know, he's quite a strapping, manly man. Is in, in a lot of these photographs, yeah, 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 yeah. the earlier like, ones. Robert Crumb looks exactly like you expect Robert Crumb to look like. <laughs> yes. But but yeah, Basil Wolverton does his eyes are in his sockets, surprisingly. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, He's not going to the whole time with like his tongue sticking out. <laughs> Who'd have thunk it? Um but you know, so the other thing that interests me is so you know, obviously he seems to have two great loves, um, which is the humor side of things and then this uh science fiction side of things mm. um and so right from the very beginning of the book we see these kind of two things coexist and he seems to have more success weirdly enough early on with the science fiction um and you know it's interesting to me just how strange later on that stuff gets and it's just he seems to get again we you know much like with his comic characters like his comedic characters which are too weird looking you know he also gets a lot of editorial stuff back saying like you're you know it's too oh, fantastic man. it's the, too the, weird the, the stringent but to, to be fair the stringent um stipulations of is it monty bro brogley no bro jelly i, I can't again mm -hmm. i can't write my right name but it's just it's maddening it's like ah yeah we appreciate uh, but and it's always something 
really finicky and small. And and, mm -hmm. So worth mentioning as well, yeah, the, the, this, um, this quite long, um, were they originally for weird tales, maybe? This this early science fiction. And yeah, for a long period, it just has no capsules <laughs> yes. or word bubbles or anything. Mm -hmm. So quite a long stretch of it. It's just it's and that strikes me as um pretty progressive and mm -hmm. strange. And I, I don't know if they were incomplete, but the artwork is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really dense. I, I, really I still dense. don't know what the story is. But, yep. No. But I um, remember as well, uh, one, one of the few Basil Wolverton strips I remember reading, there's one, I can't remember how many panels it is. It, it must, it can't be more than five or six. And I can't remember what it's called or where it appeared, but it's a very short strip. And it's kind of like the evolution or the de-evolution, I can't remember which way around it is. And it struck me as, oh my God, Basil Wolverton has basically drawn the entire movie Altered States in like <laughs> right. five panels. It's kind of, yep. it's amazing what he can do with so little, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, so, you know, by the end of the book, see, this is where I think I actually would enjoy potentially volume two a lot. I really started to love stuff. Oh, like, yes. You know, like weird little alien characters jumping in. And, you know, so um, do you know who Matt Brinkman is? Have we talked about Matt Brinkman before? Ye yes, I think not not on uh, on here. Okay. Yeah. Often, um, yeah. yeah um, he, you know, he was connected to the Fort Thunder um scene uh where the band lightning bolt you know kind of right. come out but he's a like noise musician as well isn't he yeah yeah he's yeah. i think primarily maybe that but he he his comics i love um and in a way this this speaks to that this just like weird little fantasy characters doing strange things in an in, in alien environment um i i can overlook an awful lot of you know um and this is, the, I think, that these are the things that would have been infuriating clearly to his editors. Mm. But this is what's most interesting to me because yes. I think, in a way, um, you know, and I think, yes, I love these very kind of I don't know, strangely kind of bulky heroes that he draws. Yes. yes. Um, and so, actually, that's. I mean, maybe before we get, we I get into speaking about the thing I wanted to talk about there. Um, and there's another nice little point where they talk about um, swiping, right? Mm. And that basically um, he was one of the first people to really obviously do it. And apparently there are websites and books devoted to just tracking all of the places he swiped from. But right. basically it, it was tracing, a... Right? Sorry? Kind of tracing, yes. basically. Yes. And it was, it was something that, you know, um, comic book artists... Um, Yes, <laughs> that's a great one. <laughs> and you spot the Errol Flynn. <laughs> um, so, you know, basically, uh, either as a time-saving mechanism, or in his case, because basically, um, you know, his his draftsmanship wasn't that great, and somebody like Alex Raymond, you know, mm. who was doing Flash Gordon, you know, was creating these beautifully finished. Kind of real, yeah. So there we go. Um, there you can see where he has basically just taken a Flash Gordon face and just composited it onto one of his characters. Um, and so, but I again, I have a lot of I have a lot of sympathy for that. You know, it's it's a long established practice in comics. Um, yeah, this great panel here, skeleton yeah. whose flesh is eaten mean, away. By it's so, fascinating how how many people die. And especially in this, like the Space Patrol comic, every episode ends yeah. with them like dropping a nuke. <laughs> well, they're, they're great. They're, they're, ah, it's those guys. Weird. You mentioned like about him having this all American wholesome look, slightly at odds with the weirdness. And these com these comics have it as well, right? Because on the one hand, yeah, he has these really bizarre kind of alien 
creatures and but at the same time but the narrative is very two-fisted kind of mm -hmm. you know oh there's some you know there's some griblies on the on this planet and they're smuggling you know they're like smuggling like not even science fiction-y shit right yeah, 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 yeah. things and then there's they go and then set in, a, in a casino yeah right, yeah there's one that's all yeah, yeah. So, and then yeah, at the end yeah drop a megaton bomb that'll <laughs> show them so there's that stuff but in the middle of it yeah you have these fucking things like spider people or whatever like yep. just just amazingly <laughs> strange kind of conceptual uh and uh, yeah but then mixed yeah with the, with these kind of extremely manly heroics it's just such an odd combination isn't it yeah yeah and and Look for that reason things, these floating fucking yuzu <laughs> lemon wing what the hell are those those are great those are amazing yeah. agreed agreed um yeah i just i i <laughs> These things, what is that? <laughs> they don't belong in a sec. What are those? Those are, those are just, yeah. Just, yeah, I love those. Like oh. But yeah, yeah, but everything else is very, yeah, Buck Rogers. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, um, no, it's, it's fascinating. It's, yeah, so the stuff towards the back end when he starts doing Space Patrol and Space Hawk. Um, mm -hmm. That's when this book was started to become what I was hoping mm -hmm. um, it would be, right? Um, you know, I really, as I said, I'm, I'm actually, I am quite seriously considering getting the second volume because I have a feeling it's going to be a lot more of this. Um, and so what's yeah. also interesting to me is, is, you know, right near the end of the, the book, right near the end of the, the biographical information of the book, um, basically... Um, we should mention it ends just after Pearl Harbor, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. yeah, and so there is there is this um, uh, part where they kind of they they go. So obviously, there is a bit of a mania for science fiction comics that happens. Uh, I assume largely because of um, Flash Gordon. Yeah, and um, and when, like when's Buck Rogers? Thirties, isn't it? Yeah, as well. Yeah, so yeah. that that is probably roughly around the same kind of time, um, and then we see the beginnings of superhero comics it like uh, just kind of where he does his like um you know underground secret agent rockman right rockman um, i love rockman the whole yes. idea of, uh, look at this dude <laughs> yeah rockman was yeah it's just such a it's it's, it's it's that weird kind of what i like of this era as well is they have a a, a concept a high concept science fiction concept but then they don't really bother with the technical details, right? It's nope. just, yeah, he lives, you know, underground and he can travel anywhere through these subterranean tunnels or sometimes just punches through the, and there's no, they don't even try and like, ah, fuck it, no one cares about the details. And you know what? I don't, I'm just nope. really enjoying Agreed. this crazy action, right? Um, yeah, I think there's some, the nice stuff where he, yeah, there's like, yeah, this, this is great. Like when he's getting ready to go up and, um, and there's just all these little like weird, like lizard monsters that apparently live deep below the earth's crust, you know, like it's a whole little ecosystem down there. But then, you know, it's, it's always really prosaic. Like he, like there's some guys who are like, I don't know, breaking into a, a an airplane factory or something like that. There's a monster of Goricon. That's just that's <laughs> you should look at that all day, good news. It's yes. a combination of the scantily clad woman, a fucking strange monster, this two-fisted hero, and and a skull as well. Yep. Just, just yep. Uh, it's just yeah, it's great. It's what dreams are made of. Mm -hmm. And that's a great story too. Like, I mean, you know, in that like that that meteor Martin story like wastes no time getting to the crazy right you know yeah oh like yeah it's... that's what i mean from the go right it's just there might be one set of panel like major madden hangs out on the space station and then yeah he's yeah. zapped into another dimension um, right full of crazy creatures and um yeah 
yeah no so i mean i that stuff but so what i was going to say was you know with the kind of um the coming of the war basically right and this they kind of talk about how he gets you know a lot of the comic artists um get drafted into you know well they i mean they all a lot of them actually got drafted later on i don't know I, i'm guessing that wolverton doesn't but you know Stan Lee did, um, you know, a number of the other kind of artists at that time did actually go um, to Europe and did fight. Um, but at the very end of the book, Stan Lee becomes the editor of Timely Comics, right, which mm. is basically the precursor to Marvel. Right. And he's 19 years old, which is amazing uh, to think a 19 year old Stan Lee is the editor. Um, but right away, I mean, he's quoted on the back of the book in part because he was a big booster of um, Wolverton's stuff, and that it makes it makes perfect sense if you've had this generation of of um, more conservative kind of editors who are like, "Oh, this is all weird." Like this to it that Stan Lee would be no, no, no. Like this guy who you know was quite a bit older than Stan Lee at this point. He'd be in his, I think, Wolverton's in his early thirties at the end of the this book, right? Right. Um, you know, basically, this here's this guy in his early thirties doing this stuff that's completely out there, but yet in many ways anticipates a lot of what Stanley would be doing in the sixties. You know, right. and right, you know, but then you know Jack Kirby's also working at this time too, right? I mean, this is when the original run of Captain America happens, um, and so yeah, a lot, a, but it just it seems like it seems like obviously he was just too far ahead of his time. Yes, right. Yes, and that. The world had to catch up with Wolverton's fecund, feasund, however you say that word, imag imagination, and, and all just the weird. And then, but did he work? Like again, I, I want, I want the next, I want the next volume because, like, did he ever work for EC? He seems like he would be a perfect fit for. Not that I know of. Not that I know of. Right. I'm wondering if but it's wonder... a bit too like rough around the edges. What? Not that so much. Is is. There's there seems to be all one of the pleasures I have in it. It's, there's almost a slightly comic, like as 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 weird and bizarre some of his creatures are. They're very difficult to despise or hate. They they're kind of cute, lovable. You know, they're, yeah, they're, yeah, they're wide eyed or kind of round. Or there's just something. There's nothing gross about them. They're just bizarre. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily lend itself to horror mm -hmm. if you see what i mean it's just it's just and I'm, weird I'm, <laughs> it's just and I'm wondering if, strange. I'm wondering if the weird science stuff again if i think about the artists who worked like wally wood and stuff like they were like crazy talented in terms of just like they, they had their the technical stuff down completely and i yeah, wonder exactly. if it's just a little bit too weird and woolly yeah this stuff's <laughs> like it's that weird it's that sweet spot sweet spot between inspired genius and and outsider artist not yeah. quite knowing what you're doing mm -hmm. and we'll get to this i'm hoping i'm going to get you to pick up um the fletcher when the fletcher henderson collections uh uh in the future because okay. that kind of ties in a little bit in terms of that cross-section between even more like super amateurish but yeah also mm -hmm. kind of weird genius as well mm -hmm. um but, but i think i think wolverton becomes a bit of a as i said i think all of those artists who come later on in the 60s and then even in, again in the 90s like all the underground comic artists he became becomes a touchstone he's a bit yes. of a rosetta stone he, yeah, he is yeah. that way that like everyone listened to the stooges album you know, whether it was the Sex Pistols or, you know, the Ramones, everyone was like, oh, yeah, it feels like Wolverton is that for underground comics. Well, I, I put it a bit differently. I'd say so he is far ahead of his time. But on the other hand, what's fascinating about it is that mixture of he's far ahead of his time, but also very much of his time. And so if you think mm -hmm. of the, the two fisted heroes and the casual racism. So I think that's what makes it even more. So it's not so much. I don't think it's so much the Stooges as it would be like some kind of even earlier like garage rock. Garage band. rock, yes. Who only yeah, yeah. recorded one single and it was, you know, kind of a, 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 a Rolling Stones ripoff, but then suddenly had some kind of like 
I'm shredding noise so low in the middle. Right. That mm -hmm. kind of thing, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That seems like a, that's a good metaphor. Um, but uh, yeah, no, no. I actually, I have to say, overall, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. Um, yes. I would have. No, yes. I would. I mean, I, I agree that it is probably for somebody who is either already really interested in comics generally or already interested in Basil. But yeah, to be I honest, mean, in a way, it was a good choice for this because I had was forced to to deal with it because we had to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Whereas the the temptation, if I'd have just bought it as a casual reader, would have been, oh, I'll just put this back on the shelf mm -hmm. and then order some more Wolverton. And then once I'm established as a full on fan, maybe mm -hmm. I'll go back and, and read this. Um, yeah. So, but no, it is, and, and if you if you're already interested in it, I mean, it is. I'm assuming volume two is 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 just as definitive as as um, this yeah, would be. Exhaustive, yeah, and and, and uh, I guess potential future volumes as well, right? But but mm -hmm. I mean, Fantagraphics always. I mean, they always do a good. I I mean, I have yet to pick up a Fantagraphics book and think, oh, I was a bit shoddy. Or, yeah, no. You know, they, think, they don't do that. Gary Groth, I think, is the publisher there, and he seems to, you know, yeah, they take comics very seriously at Founder Graphics. Um, although for a, the longest time, it seemed as though their entire edifice was based or was built upon their other imprint, Eros Comics, ah. um, which published an enormous amount of pornography in comics form. And it was kind of like that's where they actually made their money. And then they could do these prestige, beautiful things like this. Um, but I'm not sure right. to what degree that's still the case. I don't know how, I don't know if Eros still exists or or not, but for a while, their catalog was enormous. Um, and certain people like, um, like the Hernandez, not maybe, not, maybe not both brothers, but I think Gilbert Hernandez, maybe? Mm -hmm. he, did a, he did a whole Mexican telenovela, like triple X thing called Birdland, which is actually quite a lot of fun because it's, he's a great, storytelling right. um right. but um but yeah so they would have they would actually have some of their prestige artists also working in their sex line of comics um yeah i mean the yeah. thing is the the temptation with um with fantagraphics is and you know that wouldn't necessarily be a, a bad thing to do but it, it is such a temp they they've put out so much stuff now that is you know, real corner stone, um, you know, work putting. You know, this is so tempting for this just to turn into the Fantagraphics YouTube series. You know, just yes. each episode is you know because yeah. you 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 know it is pretty much a now it is the foundation for a lot of at least if we're talking um, North American comics. Yeah, I'm, I'm not also quite sure how much European stuff they've done or 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 certainly Japanese and stuff like that. I, I, yeah. I get the feeling that's maybe been left to maybe some other publishers. There are, well, I mean, in, in North America, there are really just, there are really just two major publishers of art comics. And they're drawn in quarterly, which is based in Canada, yeah. and fan comics. And right. that's kind of it. Um, and so drawn in quarterly, you know, they would publish, um, uh, Chester Brown, who we've already talked about, you know, yeah. um, in a previous episode, they published Joe Matt, Seth, um, but then they also published, um, they published quite a lot of Japanese comics, actually, but they okay. tend, again, to go towards that more Gekiga, um, serious, you know, serious stuff. Right, uh, right, not, whereas Thunder Graphics not, might do the, the Astro Boy collection or something like that, though, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we probably shouldn't talk too much more about this yep. because I just realized I don't actually really know what I'm talking about and I don't really, <laughs> but that's never stopped us before. No, um, no, not at all. Um, but yes, anyway, I would say, I, the only other thing that, that I, I want to say is that it just reminds me of how much action and storyline they used to pack into like five pages of comics. And this yeah. is a thing where I think um, fans of comics over time have have gotten, and part of it actually is the influence of Japanese comics, is the idea of like, oh, we need to 
stretch things out, right? Mm. But the problem with that is in Japan, you get you get 60 pages of comic or whatever. That is your chapter, right? Whereas yeah. in the States, it's it's only ever 20 pages of comic. And if 10 of those pages are splash panels <laughs> where nobody's taught, like it, it starts to get really, um, you know, it, you see it more actually in, in, in anime TV series where like it takes five episodes for something to happen. And you're like, okay, stop telescoping all the action to this degree where like nothing is happening. Um, and I think that I think when I go back and it's so refreshing to read like a balls to the wall, crazy story that right. takes five pages and has a million and one things happening in it, all these different ideas. And um, yeah, I think maybe that's because I grew up reading 2080 in British comics, where again, you did a lot with a little space, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, and you know, again, I'm happy to read a 25 page long scene of. Let's bring up, let's bring up Lone Wolf and Cub. I feel like we've never talked about Lone Wolf and Cub before in any of these before. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to see 25 pages of, of Lone Wolf staring at Retsudo because it works in that context. But but sometimes you just want to get five pages of a guy falling through a hole in space and ending up on a planet with Wibblies where he has to punch him out and meets a really cute girl. And and it all happens in three pages. That reminds me, don't forget to uh, mail in and we'll send you our uh, bingo cards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. Anything else? Um, uh, no, I think we're good. I think I, uh, oh, well, Thomas Million, of course, but I don't know how he relates. <laughs> uh. Bingo! <laughs> right. Um, yeah, until... I think we're going to be there. Um, yeah, I, I, re I recommend it. Yes, I recommend it as well. Lots uh, of fun. Yeah. Uh, that's a hell of a great ending there. Well, we Fist. can go back to our phrases. Fist! <laughs>